Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you also for uh, giving me some, some patience as I, uh, as I got here a little bit late. Can you all hear me OK? I have a habit of like standing really close to the microphone. So <laughs> if it gets too loud and I need to step back, just let me know. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Preservation Detroit and what we do and how we do it and why we think it's important. And um, to make up for the fact that I got here a little late, if you want to um, spend five minutes talking fun Detroit history stories at the end, that's cool too. So um, I, uh, as uh, Carl said, I'm with Preservation Detroit. I will, uh, I will try to get a set up here. Whoops. Um, I, to tell you a little bit about myself and how my engagement with the organization, um, I am the president of the Board of Directors of Preservation Detroit. I have held that position since September 2013. I joined the board in April 2013, um, so uh, almost a year now, or two years, of being on the Board of Preservation Detroit. Um, I have no background in architecture or architectural history or historic preservation at all, um, and this is a totally volunteer position. In my day job, I work in um, online media, so um, a little bit of a funny um, volunteer position for me to do. Um, I came into the organization because I am a local history writer. I have a little blog about pre-automotive Detroit history, so the 19th century and earlier than that. Um, and I do a lot of talks. I do tours around the community. Um, and I have a little um, social group called the Detroit Drunken Historical Society. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that. Um, but we do talks every month at different bars in and around Detroit about topics of historical interest. The Preservation Detroit Board of Directors contacted me and said, hey, we're looking to grow the organization. We'd really like you to join us. And I told them, look, I'm not a buildings person. Like, I don't know about his, the architectural history. I am, can't tell a Beaux-Arts building from a, a, a uh, I can't even come up with another example because that's how uh, bad I am at architectural history. But um, I, uh, I was really just not convinced that I had the chops to do it. And they kind of sold me on the idea of preservation being about a lot more than a really beautiful building, an important and significant architect. Um, they kind of gave me the sales pitch about how preservation is about quality of life in our communities and economic development and small businesses, having great spaces to set up shop and all of these things that I really care about as somebody who's interested in um, living in cities, who's interested in urban development and community development and um, all of those things that I do kind of in my day job in the online media space. I work for a company that covers the growth and transformation of cities just like Detroit. Um, and also as somebody who's interested in history, even though I'm more interested in old manuscripts and people people who've been dead for 150 years, and cemeteries and things like that. Um, I, I came to realize that preservation is really about um, you know, the hands-on way that we can all protect the history that we all love and are interested in and are passionate about um, for the future. And um, you know, there's no better way to do that than to be able to walk by a building and look up at it and say, this is where a really interesting thing happened, or um, this is really representative of a time in Detroit's history when a lot of people from a certain area of the world were moving here, or what whatever. So um, that, was my, uh, that was my entrance into the organization. Before I knew it, I was running the organization. I don't know what I got myself into, but that's my life. Um, a little bit about Preservation Detroit. You may have known us previously as Preservation Wayne. Um, it's the same organization, if you're familiar with the work of Preservation Wayne. The reason that it used to be called Preservation Wayne is because we did a lot of historic preservation work in and around the campus of Wayne State University. A lot of people uh, uh, m incorrectly believed that we were a uh, Wayne County-wide preservation organization, and that had led to a lot of confusion. Um, we also felt like it was important to have Detroit in our name because we serve the city of Detroit and everything within the city, um, not just limited to the campus area. So um, we rebranded in 2012. If there's any confusion about that, I hope I've cleared it up just now. Uh, we were founded in 1975, um, so we're celebrating our 40th anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, the reason that uh, Wayne, uh, Preservation Wayne was founded was to save this house. This is the David McKenzie House. It is on Cass Avenue between Forest and Hancock. Um, right next to the Hillbury Theater, which is the little, the white square building you see just to the side of it. Um, the Mackenzie House was built in 1895. It is a Queen Anne style Victorian era home. It's very beautiful, uh, both on the inside and the outside. The inside is full of lots of beautiful um, native wood. 
uh, like pocket doors and beautiful uh, wood wainscoting all around the front floor. It's really great. Um, but Wayne State uh, owned, owned this house and still owns this house. And uh, they were interested in tearing the house down. They were working on a development next door to the house of apartment, apartment units for student housing. Um, and uh, the house was right where, over where they wanted to build the sewer line that would serve the apartment complex. Um, so a group of Wayne State students got together and they decided that um, they didn't really think the demolition of the McKenzie House was in the best interests of the uh, university or its population. And they advocated and they fundraised and they saved the house and then they, were, uh, they became the caretakers of the house. They rehabilitated it and now it is the headquarters of Preservation Detroit. So we're still there, it's still owned by Wayne State. We have a much better relationship with Wayne State University than we used to. Um, uh, and uh, the apartment complex that they wanted to build has since been demolished. <laughs> and now it's a parking lot, you can't see it, but just to the south of the McKenzie House is a big surface lot. So um, as a side note, the fate of the McKenzie House is currently um, a little bit uncertain um, because on that surface lot, they are planning to build a huge expansion of the Hillbury Theater. Um, they wanna create kind of a state of the arts uh, performing art complex that would be more than the Hillbury, but also include um, set shops and costume shops and things like that. Right now, Wayne State has to do all of that in different places around the cast corridor. Um, they like to tell this um, sad story about having to truck their sets down Cass Avenue from one shop to the Hillbury. And um, it doesn't create a great uh, learning environment for their theater and performing arts students. What they want to do with the McKenzie House um, is move it um, from where it is currently on Cass Avenue, just around the corner to Forest, facing another row of 19th century Victorian homes. Um, Preservation Detroit has not really uh, worked out how we feel about this yet, but we think it's pretty far in the future, probably three or four years while Wayne State fundraises for the project. Um, our, our biggest interest is in making sure that the McKenzie House is protected and not demolished, uh, but Wayne State has told us that they have no interest in demolishing the house this time around, so we're hoping they stick to that word. Um, and uh, this is our mission as an organization, to protect, promote, and preserve the architectural and cultural assets that uniquely define Detroit. So uh, we have reworked this mission, mission many times. We're in the process of reworking it again. Um, but we want to reflect to the community that we're interested not only in the beautiful skyscrapers that we all love, uh, that, that really give the city character, but also the neighborhoods, the smaller buildings that we don't think of when we think of architectural masterworks in Detroit, places of cultural heritage, not just architectural heritage. Uh, right now we're working on a National Register nomination for a home uh, called the Orsal McGee home, which was the home, uh, the home of a young middle class couple uh, who were African American, who were, um, who were the subject of housing discrimination in their neighborhood. Um, their case eventually went to the Supreme Court and created protections against housing discrimination that um, are really important. So those kinds of, uh, you know, the house itself, you might not even know when driving by that it was so important, but we believe that as a, as a work of cultural history, it's important to, to preserve it. So, uh, preservation, uh, so this is Old City Hall, I heard somebody say, um, and uh, I, I bring this up because I, um, I gave a talk to a group of students at uh, CCS a couple of weeks ago, and I showed a picture of this building, and I talked a little bit about the role of Old City Hall in city politics in the 19th century, and a student um, raised her hand and said, so why doesn't that building exist anymore? And I was like, oh, that's a, a great question and a sad, a sad answer, which is that um, people did not really want to save Old City Hall. Uh, it was demolished in 1961, um, and it was demolished, this is, so this is right in Campus Martius, um, as some of you may remember, uh, right across from what is now the Chase Building right here. And um, what was that? Oh, sorry. Um, so. Old, Old City Hall uh, was uh, built in the late 19th century, and at the time that it was demolished, people thought it looked just old. They were like, it was like your grandma's couch. Like, why do I want this ugly piece of architecture in the middle of our brand new, economically bustling, vibrant, futuristic, uh, technologically advanced city? This just looks like a relic from the old days. It looks dusty, it looks cramped, and uh, grimy and we just want to we just want to remove it so that we can build flashy new buildings that will represent the future and the growth and the development of the city 
Um, and this was before there was a kind of a consciousness in the United States about historic preservation. There were people who wanted to save the building, but weren't quite sure how to organize around it. There wasn't legislation that existed that protected the building um, in any way through city ordinances or policies. So um, it was decided that the building had to go, and it went. Um, this is, uh, this is Penn Station in New York City. This was kind of a, a watershed moment in historic preservation. It's uh, sometimes people will refer to other controversies over buildings as a Penn Station moment, um, where everybody kind of rallies around a significant property and advocates for its preservation. Um, Penn Station was built in 1911. It was designed by McKim, Mead, and White. Uh, the white of McKin, Mead, and White was Stanford White, the subject of the crime of the century, assassinated by a jilted lover. Um, and uh, anyway, um, this, was, uh, this was another example of a musty old grandma's couch building in the middle of the city that was seen as an impediment to progress and to, and to the sort of vision of the future. So on the site of Penn Station, which was demolished in 1963, uh, was Madison Square Garden, and uh, Madison Square Garden was seen as this new, futuristic, exciting development prospect, and Penn Station was in the way of that progress and had to go. Um, and, uh, and it's still t like a very traumatic moment in New York City history, certainly, but in architectural history across the United States, the loss of Penn Station was really devastating. However, after Penn Station, people kind of woke up. They were like, oh my god, people, anybody who has money and owns a building and wants to build something new can just tear down these works of architecture that are really significant to our communities, that are really beloved by the public, and that we think are really important, not just as works, as buildings, but as works of art, um, as, as part of our history. Um, we need a mechanism in place to be able to protect these buildings um, and not just tear them down without any accountability. Um, and so after the demolition of, of Penn Station, uh, you started to see preservation ordinances happening all around the country, starting with New York City, which passed its preservation ordinance in 1965, um, still one of the most important historic preservation ordinances locally in the country, and the model of a lot of ordinances that happened after that. Um, there was also a National Historic Preservation Act that was passed in 1966, uh, which uh, is still um, part of how we practice historic preservation today. Um, the National Preservation Act created what's called Section 106 Review, which is when any um, any project that's using, using federal funding is happening, you have to do a Section 106 review to understand the impact on any historic properties in that, in that area. So um, we still do Section 106 when we go to Historic District Commission. Um, we do Section 106 appropriateness on all of the changes that are happening to a property, not just demolition or preservation, but um, you know, do you want to change the facade? Do you want to add an addition to the building? And how should you style it to preserve the historic character of your neighborhood? Um, Detroit also has a historic preservation ordinance. It was passed in 1976. Um, and this is how we do preservation in the city of Detroit. Uh, the ordinance reads, historic preservation is declared to be a public purpose, and the city may regulate the construction, reconstruction, alteration, repair, moving, and demolition of historic and architecturally significant structures within the limits of the city as provided. So, um, so the first thing that we do as preservationists when something is up for, for instance, demolition, um, we look to see if the building is in a historic district, because this ordinance applies to anything that is historically designated locally by the city of Detroit. Um, since this ordinance, hundreds of districts have been created in Detroit, um, and individual buildings have been created as their own districts, so um, the, anything that's in a historic district goes to our City of Detroit Historic District Commission, and the commission reviews it, and they decide whether or not to allow these projects, whether they're demolition or, again, an addition to somebody's house. Um, I was at a Historic District Commission meeting uh, last year, which Kid Rock attended, because Kid Rock owns a house in the Barry subdivision, which is where the Manoogian Mansion is, and uh, Kid Rock uh, wanted to build a boat deck and a garage attached to his house, but he lives in a historic district, so he has to go get permission to do those things from the Historic District Commission. Um, it was quite dramatic because his neighbors don't like him, and uh, they had a lot of opinions <laughs> about his project. Um, but this is how this is the kind of the main lever of preservation in Detroit. So if uh, if we're worried about the fate of a building, if it's in a historic district, we know we have some measure of protection because we can go to the historic district commission and ask them as a public 
body uh, to make the right choice. Um, if something is not in a district, it doesn't mean all hope is lost, but it makes it a lot harder to be able to preserve uh, the building for the future. It involves a lot of things like making friends with the owners and convincing them not to do something bad. Uh, sometimes that also <laughs> involves some measure of public shaming of the owners of the development. Um, and uh, it also, um, we can also look at, at new projects for designation, um, and we're actually working on a couple of designation projects right now, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think preservation is so great and so important and why people should care about it, but I have to tell you some sad things about it first. Um, and in some ways this is a little bit of a defensive measure because I get asked all the time by people, um, you know, why don't they just tear down that abandoned building? Why doesn't somebody just buy the train station? Why doesn't, um, you know, why doesn't anybody care about this stuff? How could they let that happen? All of these questions are questions I deal with all the time. Um, so I'll tell you a few of the sad stories first and then we'll go on to the exciting stuff. Um, so uh, the biggest thing that I think it's important to understand about historic preservation is that historic preservation doesn't always work. Um, this is the, uh, on the left here, this is the David Whitney building, which is a great preservation success story. If you haven't been downtown in a while, I would definitely recommend going to check out the David Whitney building. It is now in a loft hotel. This is right on Grand Circus Park. Um, huge bajillion dollar renovation with a gorgeous um, lobby you can just walk right into. It's like a four story atrium with a beautiful skylight on top. It's just so delicious and absolutely wonderful to see it back to life. Um, but on the right is the Statler Hotel, um, also on Grand Circus Park, equally beautiful, equally historic. The Statler Hotel is gone. The, the Statler was demolished in 2005, um, right before the Super Bowl. Uh, that was actually a rough time for historic preservation in Detroit. A lot of properties were torn down because they were seen as being blighted and eyesores, and the city wanted to get as much of that out of the way as possible before millions of people came to Detroit to come see a football game. Um, and in that case, uh, in many, in many many instances the historic review process was kind of leapfrogged so that those demolitions could happen quicker. In the case of the Statler, the Statler did go to the Historic District Commission. My understanding is that they approved the demolition of the Statler because it was uh, too far gone to save, um, possibly also because the mayor was pressuring the Historic District Commission to make that decision in some ways. So right now, uh, in, you know, in a brand new climate, 10 years later, with a lot of development, a lot of economic activity happening in Detroit, you have one great example of how great historic preservation can be in a downtown area. One example, uh, now a vacant lot of um, lost opportunities to preserve our historic assets. Um, so why doesn't preservation always work? Well, here are a few pet reasons that I deal with every day. <laughs> um, not all historic buildings in Detroit are protected by historic designation. Um, I'm sure you all recognize this building. This is the JL Hudson building right downtown. Uh, the building was demolished, I'm sorry, that's a typo. The building was not demolished in 1989. It was demolished in 1998. Um, but the Hudson's building was, um, this was, if there was a Penn Station moment in Detroit history, this was the one. Um, huge building, widely beloved by the community, seen as a totally um, viable property um, that was just um, a, some, a building that we all had memories of. I would say that the, the memories that people want to share with me of Detroit history often involve the Hudson's building or going to Hudson's or riding the streetcar to get to Hudson's or go home from Hudson's or whatever. Um, I remember watching the demolition of Hudson's on TV. I was very young, but I also ha remember thinking, like, why, why, why are they taking this down? I don't, I don't really understand why they need to blow up this building, uh, except maybe for spectacle. Um, and in some ways, it was about spectacle. It was about a building that was blighted. It was in a downtown area. Um, Mayor Archer wanted to see it go because it was ugly, and we needed to think about the future, and the future of Detroit does not include blighted, ugly buildings. And there were people who wanted to develop on the site, and wouldn't it be great if we had a brand new building here instead of an old building that nobody likes and is completely neglected? Um, so the building is imploded. Uh, nothing is built on the site. You may, uh, you may be aware that nothing has been built on the site yet. It is an empty lot. Um, however, there have been uh, plans recently floated uh, by, the, by the Bedrock Company owned by Dan Gilbert uh, to finally redevelop the site uh, with some fancy new modern architecture, which is very exciting. However, um, the, there was a preservation effort around the Hudson's building. It was a very loud, big, vocal preservation movement, um, but the building was not in a historic district at the time, and um, it was didn't have to go through a historic 
historic district re review. So uh, when the decision was made by the city to tear it down, there wasn't a lot left to do. Um, I just read an article before I came here today uh, by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which basi basically said, you know, you can't win every battle. This is not one we're going to win. Um, so that was a huge loss. Um, there's another problem, and this problem is really particular to Detroit. Um, it's called demolition by neglect. Um, and this is the situation that I think is um, tricky when people ask me as a, as a leader in preservation in Detroit, well, why, why, don't we, um, why don't we just tear down the ugly buildings that are blighted and vacant? Or um, why doesn't anybody do anything with that building is another one um, that I love. So this is the University Club. It's located on, it was located on Jefferson Avenue, um, and it was demolished in 2013 after two huge fires. Um, the second of which basically um, destroyed what was left of the building after the first fire. Um, this building was owned by an owner who didn't want anybody else to own the building and who didn't want to do anything with it himself. Um, and when owners want to hold on to their property but they don't necessarily want to do the responsible thing and take care of their building, um, they often practice what is called demolition by neglect, and that is letting your building fall apart slowly, day by day, leaving it open to the elements, leaving it open to trespassers, leaving it open to um, water damage from rain or snow or possibly you know, arson. Um, so uh, this was the case of a developer who just didn't feel like taking care of his building. And in doing so, he, uh, he starts to create the case over time that that building should go away. So it makes it easier for a developer who's dem demolishing a building by neglect over time to convince the public that that building needs to go. Um, if it looks like an eyesore, if it's a safety hazard, if it's burned out because somebody has on purpose been letting their building fall apart, um, over, the, over the course of a few years, it can really make the public rally behind the building's demolition rather than its preservation. Um, there was another problem that was specific to the University Club related to the last slide I shared, which was that the building was not in a historic district and it wasn't historic protected. Um, it did go all the way to City Council uh, as a proposed designated historic district, and the City Council uh, did not vote to designate the building um, for some complicated reasons, um, largely related to the fact that um, there was a sentiment on the City Council that this building had an unfortunate um, racist history and that they didn't want to preserve it because it was a place that was not seen as welcoming to African Americans. It was a place that wasn't seen as um, culturally relevant to the city's African American population, which is actually, n in the case of the University Club, is not true uh, because the University Club was integrated. Coleman Young was a member of the University Club, so um, we don't have that issue here, but it was kind of a misunderstanding um, at the level of city council that allowed the building to fall into the state of disrepair that it did. That was actually an issue with the Hudson's building as well. Um, there were a lot of people in the community who maybe weren't actively lobbying for the demolition of the Hudson site, but maybe didn't care about it as much as they could have because they felt like, well, the Hudson's building was for white people. Um, they had discriminatory hiring practices, and it wasn't always an integrated shopping experience, and that um, made a lot of members of the African American community in Detroit feel alienated from the Hudson site. But there were a lot of black preservationists at the time, including the president of preservation, Wayne Jim Turner, um, who felt like even though the history isn't pretty and it's not comfortable and it's not nice, it's still part of the history of this community, including members of the black community, um, and um, that because it it makes people feel kind of icky, that's not really a reason that you should just tear the building down because it doesn't mean it's not relevant and it doesn't mean it doesn't tell a story about the lives that we all live in Detroit in a diverse and um, certainly long, uh, and it just um, you know, a melting pot of experiences for, for lots of different people who experience the city's history in lots of different ways. It's important to be able to tell those stories um, even when we're uncomfortable with them. Um, here's another example of a building that was demolished, uh, despite the best efforts of preservationists. This is the Madison Lennox Hotel, and uh, these buildings were historically designated, and they did go to the Historic District Commission, and the District Commission did vote on whether or not they should be allowed to be demolished. Um, and uh, they were owned by Mike Illich, and Illich wanted to take them down because he felt they were blighted and eyesores and didn't like them, etc. Um, this was also around Super Bowl time, so some of that same issue around optics, you know, do we want people to see our blighted, ugly buildings, or do we just want to take them down and do other things? Um, and um, in this case, the Historic District Commission said, 
no, actually, we don't want you to tear down the Madison Linux. They did not approve the demolition. Uh, and then the city ruled it an emergency, and they started to demolish it anyway. So um, there was actually, Preservation Wayne was involved in an emergency, um, not an emergency, uh, what's it called? A temporary restraining order. Uh, and they went to court and said, we need to stop this demolition. It's illegal, and um, it can't happen. Um, so a judge put a temporary restraining order on the property, um, but it was ruled that by then enough of the property had been demolished that it was no longer in a safe condition and the demolition was allowed to proceed. Um, so uh, Preservation Wayne tried to sue and uh, it, was, it was ruled that we did not have standing. Um, that's a legal situation that I don't fully understand, but that's okay. Um, anyway, um, it does happen sometimes that despite the best efforts of the preservation community and despite the many protections that we have with the historic district ordinance, um, demolitions happen anyway because people want them to. So um, that was a bad situation that um, we still uh, cry about sometimes. Um, here's another example of a historic district commission building, uh, or I'm sorry, a historically designated building um, that was demolished despite the historic district commission's approval. Um, and I think this is a good example of how politics can uh, make things kind of complicated and why preservation is kind of a political activity um, at its heart. Uh, so this is the Deck Bar building. This is on Jefferson Avenue at Jefferson and Alter, way on the east side of the city. Um, and the building was owned by the city of Gross Point Park. Gross Point Park bought the building um, way back in 2008 with the intent to demolish the building. They wanted to tear it down to build a bus turnaround. Um, but the city decided that the building was of historic note and they designated it after the city of Gross Point Park bought it. Um, and uh, after that, the city of Gross Point Park had a hard time demolishing the building because the Historic District Commission said they couldn't. So uh, it came back to Historic District Commission at the end of last year. Um, this is, um, this is um, not only, this was an old state bank building, uh, I believe it was the American State Savings Bank, and it also, for a while, was the city's, uh, was, a, was a gay bar that is one of the city's oldest surviving gay bars, and it's like a very um, celebrated site in Detroit uh, gay and queer history. So uh, it's locally designated on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the city of Gross Point Park didn't, after they were disallowed from demolishing the building in 2008, um, they didn't do anything with it. They didn't secure it. They didn't um, at least mothball it or secure it from the elements. Um, and uh, this is, so this is a little bit of a demolition by neglect situation as well because they came back to the Historic District Commission last year and said, this is a dangerous property. We have kids walking back and forth to school. Um, we have a church next door with a, like a youth group, and we just think this is, a, this is an unsightly and a dangerous site, Wh to which the Historic <laughs> District Commission said, and this was, um, you know, this is a classic argument, uh, the Historic District Commission was like, it's your building. You can secure it, or you can fix the roof, or you can board up the doors. It's up to you. It's, you own it. You are, not, you, you are in no situation right now where you lack control. Uh, Gross Point Park said, but we want to tear it down anyway. Historic District Commission said, why don't you just take the money you would have spent on demolition and secure it? You don't have to redevelop it, just secure it so it doesn't fall down on anybody. And they said, no, they don't want to do that. Uh, in any case, the Historic District Commission denied their appeal, and um, then in January, it was demolished anyway. Um, we, um, there are a lot of reasons why this might have been, but um, it's pretty clear that this is related to the relationship between the city of Detroit and the city of Gross Point Park. Um, if any of you have been following the news around the shed that was built at the end of uh, Kerchival Road um, that kind of physically blocked the border between Detroit and Gross Point Park, um, the mayor of Detroit has been trying to build diplomacy with the city of Gross Point Park to get them to take down the shed, to, to try to improve the relationship between Detroit and Gross Point Park. Um, and we think that it's probably likely that the mayor had some kind of deal worked out with Gross Point Park where he said, look, um, we can get this taken down for you. We know that blight is a problem and that it's something we need to deal with. Can you also take down the shed building and can we just move on um, with, with a good accord between the two of us? Um, so th this building, it's not the building's fault that it was the subject of this uh, difficult diplomatic uh, dealing. I also personally don't think that that was the right decision for the mayor to make, especially because, um, you know, in my view, when a building is historically protected, you open it up to community engagement with the building. And that's one of the great things about historic district protection um, that allows people like me or you to go to a public meeting, to have your opinions about the future of the building heard by the committee. Um, it's also not the case that the Historic District Commission is always like, don't tear anything down. Like, 
uh, in my experience, the Historic District Commission is really good um, at hearing context and understanding how the community feels. I've been to plenty of meetings where um, you know, the community has showed up in force and said, you know what, this is a blighted building and we do think it's dangerous and we'd really like for it to go. And the District Commission will hear that and they will say, okay, we'd, you know, we think this is a perfectly fine building, but if you're worried about it and 70 of you showed up tonight, we're gonna vote accordingly. Um, so I don't really think it was the mayor's place to say, I'm sorry, this building needs to go down anyway, um, but so it happened. Um, the legal way that this happened was that the city ordered an emergency demolition because it was ruled that the building was unsafe. Um, and when those emergency demolitions happen, there is no recourse, there's no, um, there's no kind of check and balance against what, what decisions are made from an emergency standpoint. Um, and that's why we lost the deck bar. So um, anyway. Um, after, after all of these sad stories, you may be asking, why bother? What is even the point of saving old buildings in Detroit? Kanye West wants to know. Um, again, I hear a lot, it's, an, it's such a nice building, why don't you just buy it? You hear that on like internet comment threads too, right? People are like, oh yeah, well all these people want to save a building, but they're not buying the building. But often that's not even an option, which is why I included the train station here. This is another great example of demolition by neglect, um, and uh, a classic case of why don't you just buy it then? This building is not for sale. It has not, not ever been for sale since it was purchased in the 1980s by a guy named Maddie Maroon, who also owns the Ambassador Bridge, and in owning the train station, owns the tunnels underneath the train station that go to Canada, thereby protecting those train tunnels from ever being owned by anybody else who might want to open up those tunnels to commerce. So, um, so Maroon has let this building just fall apart for 30 years, um, although lately, to be super fair, um, he has been working on the building, and I think that this building has a future, which is very exciting. Um, there are a few new windows. Uh, you can kind of, uh, there's a game that people in court town play called Spot the Window, where it's like, oh, that one's new. Oh, they got one more in. That's great. It's new. Um, there was also talk at the end of last year of building a freight elevator inside of the train station, which would allow kind of upper level construction to start happening. So. Uh, this, this, could be, um, this could be a different narrative in the next year or two um, as I give this presentation, but um, it's not always within our control to just fix up a building on our own. So, so why bother? We would buy that train station if we could, by the way. One, we don't have any money. Two, it's not for sale. <laughs> um, there, are, um, there are a lot of good reasons to save buildings. Uh, one is that they are beautiful often they are very beautiful, and one is that they are historic. We believe this is to be true. We think these are two excellent reasons to save buildings, but they're not the only reasons to save buildings, and there are reasons that I think are even better to save historic buildings. Uh, people love living in historic buildings. So this is the Broderick Tower. This is uh, right across Grand Circus Park from the Whitney Building, which we looked at earlier. Uh, this was vacant for a long time. It was built in the 20s. It was vacant. Um, starting when I was alive and um, up until 2012. Um, now it is fully rented out. This building is totally at capacity and um, it's a great place for a lot of the young people who are moving downtown to work for Quicken, to work for Galaxy Solutions, to work for Chase, whatever. Um, this building is, um, is hopping and people love it. People love working in historic buildings. I work in a historic building, actually right next door to this building. I live, I work in an old Victorian carriage house in the Cass Corridor. Um, this is the Green Garage. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this building. It's on 2nd Avenue. Um, it is an old uh, auto dealership and now it is, has been totally uh, refurbished and renovated. It's a net zero building, which means it, um, it the impact, environmental impact of this building is zero. It doesn't, um, it uh, returns any energy that it uses um, back into the ecosystem. There's also a beautiful little green alley um, lined with native plants with a permeable driveway right next door. Um, and it's a co-working space, so people who are working on startup businesses, people who have their own businesses like photographers and um, designers and things like that can rent a co-working space at the Green Garage and work in this great, beautiful, historic, um, energy, completely energy efficient building in uh, the middle of the city, which is great. Um, people, uh, this is another uh, great place to work. This is the Grand Army of the Republic building um, on Cass Avenue in downtown Detroit. And it was built in 1899 for veterans of the Civil War as kind of a social gathering space for them. 
This building is reopening this year very soon. Actually, parts of the building are already open. There's a restaurant in this building that you can go to tonight if you want to. It's called Republic, and I've heard it's fantastic. Um, this, is, uh, this was done by a couple of small developers, the Carlton Brothers and their partner, Sean Emery. And uh, the main purpose of this building is to, uh, to be a home for Car the Carlton Brothers company, which is called Minefield. They are a video production company. And I wish I worked for them, and I wish I worked in this building. People love to have restaurants in uh, historic buildings. People love to eat in historic buildings. This is on that block on Michigan Avenue between Wabash and uh, Rosa Parks, I believe, um, which is all historic buildings that have all been beautifully redeveloped. And um, this is like really the heart of the Corktown Commercial Corridor. Um, if you look at pictures from 10 years ago, it was just all boarded up. And now it is one of the most vibrant blocks in Detroit. At the end of the block, you have Slows, where you can go have barbecue. Next to that, you have Astro Coffee, where you can get a really nice cup of coffee and pastry in the morning. Sugar House, the craft cocktail bar, is next to that. For some reason, LJ's Lounge is like a really old school Detroit dive bar that is still there and kicking, and it's great. And then at the end of the block, you have this building, which is an old pawn shop. Before that, it was an old market, and before that, it was, who knows, a, a livery, I think. But um, it was, uh, this is now a restaurant called Gold Cash Gold, one of the hottest new restaurants that opened last year. And, um, and it's been beautifully, beautifully restored, so. Um, people also like to drink in old buildings. I've uh, have made like a little cottage industry of myself, uh, taking people to historic bars in Detroit. This is Cliff Bell's. This is on Park uh, Elizabeth, I think. I'm sorry, Elizabeth and Grand Circus Park. Um, and this was uh, refurbished in 2005. If you've not been there, you should definitely go. It's a beautiful, like 1930s deco style, all wood, just like the most expensive looking place you've ever had a drink in. And there's live jazz almost every night, really great food, a fantastic place to be. Uh, people love to work in historic buildings. More importantly, people with companies like to situate their companies in historic buildings. This is the Argonaut Building. This is right across from uh, the old GM headquarters, Cadillac Place in New Center, and it was built in 1928. Uh, right now, this is home to the Taubman Center, which is um, where uh, CCS has a design program. But on the fifth floor of the building, um, it is the headquarters of Shinola, the new um, bikes, leather goods, watches company that has located in Detroit and caused a worldwide sensation. Um, I saw a great talk by one of the leather goods um, designers at Shinola last year who said that the reason that they chose a floor of this building was because the natural light is outstanding. And a lot of old industrial buildings are like this um, because it was expensive to light your factory with electricity back in the day. You would maximize the light that you had available that was free from the sun. Um, so you would build big windows. That's why um, industrial factory buildings have soft tooth windows. Um, and um, now they are great places that make your employees really happy because it sucks to be inside a dark, fluorescent lit, um, you know, cavernous room for 10 hours a day. Nobody wants to do that. Isn't it better to be able to look out at the city, to have a breeze from the window cracked open, and to not feel like you're holed up like a robot in a dark room? Um, which is why Shinola chose it, and they've seen great returns on employee satisfaction and retention because of their decision to locate in a historic factory building. Uh, people love to look at fish in historic buildings. <laughs> um, this is the Belle Isle Aquarium, of course on Belle Isle. Uh, before it closed in 2005, it was the oldest continuously operating public aquarium in the United States. And it's got this great green tile work that just shimmers in the light. It's an incredibly beautiful, totally one-of-a-kind space in Detroit. Um, it was closed in 2005 during the Kilpatrick administration and some of the city's economic woes leading up to the Great Recession. but it recently reopened, and now any Saturday, you can go to the Belle Isle, you can visit the aquarium, you can see some really cool fish. It's all volunteer run. It's just like an incredible, very Detroit experience, and it's in this great 1906 Albert Kahn design building. Um, I don't know when this, when they built the center plaza, or like if anybody was around before they did that, but that used to be the alligator pit, which is so cool. Um, people just like to be around historic buildings, and um, you know, I'm one of those um, 
I'm a millennial, and um, you know, people like to write stories about millennials like we are um, aliens from another planet <laughs> that everyone is just trying to understand. But one thing that people will say about cities is that millennials want to live in cities, real places with, with authentic character, um, and that's very true of me, and that's been true of me for my whole life before I even knew it. So I um, grew up in Farmington Hills, so not too far from here, and um, I, um, I'm very grateful for my great education and the great family life that I grew up with, but when I graduated, I could not wait to get out of Farmington Hills. I was like, this is a boring place, everything looks the same, nothing but strip malls, nothing to do. I just drive around in my car all day and go insane slowly. Um, and I moved away for college. And then um, when I graduated from college, I was like, I don't really want to go back. I didn't really like it that much. Um, and I moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which um, I didn't know anything about before I lived there. But I, but I drove there with some friends of mine who were looking for an apartment. And I fell in love, not because I was like, great stuff to do or like cool art galleries. But I was like, it's right by the lake. The whole city is very dense and it's clustered right around um, the, the bluffs overlooking Lake Michigan. And the buildings are old. And I didn't even realize until much later that this is why I loved Milwaukee. But Milwaukee's got a really great concentration of 19th century commercial buildings. It's got a great like industrial warehouse area where all of these warehouses were built in the late 1800s. Um, and you just feel like it's got a real authentic, individual, totally unique vibe. It didn't look like anywhere else I'd ever been, and I was so compelled by it. Um, this is uh, Dally in the Alley, which is a big party that happens in the Cass Corridor every September, and um, it happens in the network of alleyways between Cass Avenue and 2nd and 3rd um, in the kind of old Victorian neighborhoods around the Cass Corridor, and all of these alleys, um, they're like little garages that people pop open, they string lights around. Um, these alley, these garages, a lot of them are old auto garages, but some of them used to be like stables and carriage houses, and the alleys are all cobblestone, and there's just nothing like going to the Cass Corridor on a warm summer night with all of these people and all of these lights, but also all of these old buildings through this historic system of alleyways. There's just it's, there's no place like it on Earth, and there's nothing like being around that. And there's something that's really appealing about that when you're thinking about how to redevelop cities and how to get people back to these places that people left 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Um, you know, the historic character of our cities is one of our greatest and most underappreciated assets, in my opinion. Um, people also really, really love to visit cool, historic old cities. Um, I have a really good friend who's been in Miami all week, obsessively texting me pictures of beautiful Art Deco buildings in Miami. It's been driving me completely insane. I'm so jealous. Um, also, it's like really warm and sunny there right now, so I'm sure that's part of it. Um, but um, this is like a tourist attraction. Going to Miami and just seeing this great collection of Art Deco buildings is something that people do for fun. Um, and cities that have managed to preserve this are cities where tourists want to go and be and see and do things in. Um, New Orleans is another great example. The Old French Quarter, the Great Balconies, the wrought iron, the, the wisteria dangling from the, from the balconies, like that's just, you look at a picture of that and that's New Orleans and you want to go see that for yourself. Um, so cities that are able to preserve this really succeed at attracting tourists, attracting a tourist economy. It helps that Miami is warm, but you know. Anyway, that in sum is why I think historic preservation is good for cities. I think it's good for local economies and for the environment. It's great for attracting talent like me and tourism, uh, like people who want to go to Miami. It's great for entrepreneurs and small business owners who maybe want to find a space but don't have a lot of money um, or they are just need a place that exists so they don't have to build a whole new like campus with lots of buildings. You know, you just need a storefront. One already exists. We saved it for you. It was used by a guy who had a knife shop back in 1899. Have at it. Um, it's good for people who care about history and for people who will in the future. And that's maybe the most important thing, but it's so intangible. And when we have other serious problems in Detroit, like poverty, or lack of jobs, or lack of transit, or lack of integration between neighborhoods, historic preservation can seem like a really um, privileged concern, right? Like, oh, how nice that you want to save a really pretty skyscraper. Uh, we have really serious problems to deal with here. But if we can invest in our historic assets and our architecture and our neighborhoods and our beautiful brick buildings, we, have, we can see all of these other, other benefits that also help us overcome things like poverty and lack of investment and lack of jobs. Like it, Preservation isn't going to solve any of those problems, but it's going to contribute to building a city where solving those problems is possible. And um, that's part of the reason that I care about it. 
Um, so how do we save historic buildings? We've talked about why, we've talked about how it's really hard, makes me sad sometimes, like a puppy, but um, what, what do we do to, to, to make it happen? Um, so this is where I get to talk about Preservation Detroit and all of our fun programs and, I, and things like that. Um, but first I want to dispel the notion that we chain ourselves to buildings, climb atop wrecking balls, endanger our lives. Um, this is not really how we normally save buildings, although they make for great photo opportunities. Uh, this is a woman named Mary Stiles, and uh, she is fighting to save Grand Rapids Old City Hall, which was unfortunately torn down in 1969. Um, but Mary Stiles, in an interview later, this is a very famous picture in preservation circles, um, and in Grand Rapids especially, this is a famous one. Um, but Mary Stiles has said in interviews that she wasn't actually chaining herself to a wrecking ball in order to save the building. A local newspaper photographer was like, hey, Mary Stiles, you're a cute lady. Why don't you climb up on this wrecking ball and I'll take a picture of you. <laughs> um, so uh, even back then, this was not really how preservation was done. Although public protests, public gatherings, um, drawing attention to a threatened building is certainly part of the toolkit. Uh, oh. So uh, we do preservation through advocacy, um, you know, the various forms of chaining yourself to a wrecking ball, although usually it's more like writing a letter, <laughs> not quite as sexy. We do it through education and we do it through awareness building. So I'll talk in a little more detail about all of that. Here's a great view, just because it's beautiful, of, uh, of downtown with the old opera house. Then there's the, uh, the Merrill Palmer Fountain right in front of it. And that is now in Palmer Park. It's in terrible condition, which I'm embarrassed to say. Most of these buildings are gone now, but not all of them. This is Woodward going this way. Okay. So here are some things that we've done around advocacy with Preservation Detroit. Um, last year, we were uh, part of a partnership with the Michigan Historic Preservation Network um, to survey. Um, we ended up surveying about 18,000 properties in two weeks with 60 volunteers in the middle of January. Um, with our own cars, which was, if, if you can imagine, a total nightmare. But um, <laughs> what we, uh, the reason that we did a historic resource survey, some of you may be aware that a lot of um, money is coming into Detroit right now in order to uh, mitigate blight. Um, so uh, we have all of this federal funding. It's coming from what's called the Hardest Hit Fund, uh, which is a federal program meant to help relieve people who have been uh, the victim of the tax foreclosure situation. Um, but how Detroit and a lot of communities in the nation are using this money is to tear down blighted houses. Um, so uh, there's been some controversy about whether or not that's the best way to use money that is meant for foreclosure relief, but it's happening. Um, and in Detroit, it, uh, it has been targeted in, in a few key neighborhoods where there is a, a high level of blight, but also a strong community. So what Detroit is doing is saying, here's where we can make an impact, not in the most devastated neighborhoods, not in the most intact neighborhoods, but in the neighborhoods that are kind of in between, where if we can concentrate some effort and resources, we can really make the difference between a community succeeding and a community not succeeding. So um, our concern is that that money is not used to tear down properties that could be an asset in the revitalization of a neighborhood. So maybe a house doesn't look so great now, but it's got great architectural character. It's waiting for somebody to come along and give it just a little bit of care, and it will be better for that neighborhood in the long run if that building stays than if it goes. The other thing that we're concerned about is that a high level of vacant lot in a neighborhood is also not really helping anybody. Um, vacant lots can also become blighted. They can become dumping grounds. They can become over grown and weedy, they can be places where people can do bad stuff, which is the same with blighted houses. Um, but anyway, this is a long way of saying that what we did was um, we looked at six neighborhoods that we felt had a high historic character um, where we could do some mapping of whether or not we felt that these buildings were um, high preservation priorities, kind of medium preservation priorities, or low preservation priorities. And we provided all of that data to the citywide mapping process, and that data was used to help um, decision makers understand whether or not they should be demolishing specific buildings. They can look at that part, that preservation score, as part of a wider um, set of data around things like, is the building occupied, has the building been there hasn't been a fire, has the water been shut off, all of those things to help decide, does this building stay or does it go? And we saw a lot of really beautiful houses along the way, like this one in um, Mary Grove. Um, we've been working really, really hard. This has been like my number one thing this year on the, um, on the arena district. So as many of you probably know, there's a big new hockey arena being built uh, north of downtown, south uh, and, and the east of the Cass Corridor. 
Um, and, uh, and it's really exciting. It's, um, that's there, it's a large, empty parcel. It's a good place for an arena. Um, and we think that it will have a really positive economic impact. We've also been pleased that the designs have been very urban oriented so that it's not just a big hulky building surrounded by parking lots, but that it's really like integrated with the neighborhood. They've been very mindful about doing things like building garages instead of surface lots. Um, we're really liking what we're seeing about the design so far, but there's one little hitch. Um, these two buildings are historic hotels. Uh, the one on the left is the Hotel Eddystone. The one on the right is the Park Avenue Hotel. And they are right next to where the arena is going to be built. Mike Illich owns both of these buildings, and he's the one developing the arena project. Um, and we are pretty concerned that one or both of these buildings will probably be demolished to make way for the arena. Uh, they're both historically designated, um, and they're the only they're the only high-rise buildings in the area. So you've seen these buildings probably if you spent any time near the stadium or near Comerica Park. There's actually in front of these buildings like a big gravel surface lot where my husband and I park when we go to the Tigers games. Um, these are the only two buildings of their size and of their shape anywhere near the arena. Um, our concern is that even if you tear one of them down, you leave behind one high-rise building that looks totally out of place, like a big sore thumb pointing at the sky. Um, we also think that we know that the arena district is going to require the development of lots of new properties, new restaurants, new bars, new um, apartment complexes, new hotels. And we feel like you've got these two beautiful hotels sitting right here. They don't look great from the street level, and we realize that. They're kind of graffitied up. They're blocked off. Um, but if you get up close to these buildings, and I'm sorry I don't have any pictures of them up close, there's great architectural detail around the top of the building. The archways on the front of the Eddie Stone are just beautiful. They're in pretty good shape, even though I know they look completely hollowed out. Um, and, I, and we feel really strongly that both of these hotels should be part of the arena district development. We also feel like Mike Gillich got the land for a dollar, um, and he got a few hundred million dollars in tax subsidies. So the least you can do is follow the, uh, follow the letter of the law, which requires these buildings to be protected. And, um, and we don't think that it's out of bounds for these buildings to be redeveloped. If you look at these, um, these are both designed by Lewis Camper, um, who also designed the book Cadillac. And the book Cadillac, of course, as we all know, is a gem of historic preservation in Detroit. So we think that could be a great opportunity. Um, also around the arena district are a number of really great old historic buildings that aren't quite as big and showy as the Park Avenue and the Eddie Stone, but that have a lot of character and that contribute a lot to your feeling of being in the cast corridor and being in an authentic old um, brick and wood Detroit neighborhood of the, of the old days. Um, th these buildings are sadly gone. Um, this is an old Victorian home. Two other Victorian homes on the other side have all been torn down. Um, and that's what we are really concerned about seeing in the Cass Corridor. A lot of the buildings in the Cass Corridor um, around the arena are also owned by Mike Illich. But this whole area is not designated historically. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's just never been locally designated. So what we're trying to do is get a local historic district designation for the Cass Park neighborhood. And that will allow any demolitions to go to Historic District Commission first. We think it's likely that some of these buildings will end up being demolished, and that might have to be OK. The scale of development in this neighborhood may warrant that. But um, we'd really like the opportunity, as members of the public and as um, representatives of the membership of Preservation Detroit, we'd love to be able to go to the Historic District Commission and just see what's on the agenda. What are you planning to do with the Hotel Alhambra? What are you planning to do with these great Victorian townhomes, which have all now been torn down? Um, and, and, and can we have a say about that as a member of the public? Um, this is one of our recent victories that I'm very, very proud of. This is the State Savings Bank. This is on Fort Street. Um, and it is a, also a McKim, Mead, and White. If you recall the Penn Station slide from many minutes ago, um, a, a great example of one of the premier architects, uh, architecture firms of the 20th century. Um, this building is owned by the same guy who owns the Penobscot. And he was interested in tearing down the State Savings Bank in order to build a parking lot um, because he felt that his tenants at the Penobscot didn't have enough place to park. Um, if you go stand uh, on the corner, though, you can see like parking garage, parking garage, parking garage, parking garage. A lot of what used to be beautiful downtown building stock has now all been turned into parking garages. So um, we kind of weren't buying it. Uh, we heard that he was going to try to get this demolition approved by the Historic District Commission, and we took action. We got almost 100 people to show up. If you've ever been to a Historic District Commission meeting, 
they're usually attended by like 25 people. We got 100 people to show up and say, please don't tear down the state savings bank. We got on the phone with all of the newspapers. We were like, this can't happen. Um, and we really were able to demonstrate to the public the value of this historic property. It got people so riled up. Um, and the owner, uh, the demolition permit was not approved. The owner did not tear it down the next day anyway, thank goodness. Um, and then we started to hear reports that this building was being uh, demoed by neglect. We, uh, we had reports of broken windows, we had reports of water damage coming in from the roof, and we felt like that was a really bad sign. We were like, okay, this guy is gonna come back in a year and he's gonna be like, I don't know, my building is falling apart, it's too expensive to rehabilitate, it's a danger to the community, it has to come down. Um, and we got in touch with the owner and we were like, this can't happen, we know what you're trying to do. Um, this is this is really just, um, we, we see you. <laughs> um, and we got a bunch of neighborhood watchdogs to like, send us pictures. We called the Buildings and Safety Engineering Department in Detroit and we were like, this is a blight ordinance candidate. Please get out there and inspect it. Within a couple of weeks, we got some really good news, which was that the building owner had decided that he no longer wanted to own the state savings bank, that he had sold it to Dan Gilbert, who wants to build an automotive museum in the state savings bank, which is a really interesting, very exciting candidate for adaptive reuse of the state savings bank. So work is going on now. We've already gotten some sneak peek pictures of the inside of the building that they're totally refurbishing. Um, and we're happy to take a little bit of credit for the future of the state savings bank. Um, right now, I'm working on a project uh, called Brick and Beam. Um, this is another way that we're just kind of trying to support rehabilitation and preservation on a small neighborhood level scale. Um, I, it's really great that um, a lot of the big skyscrapers in Detroit are like taken care of now. They've been refurbished, they're at capacity, people are renting out apartment units, it's great. Um, so now we have to find some other stuff to work on. <laughs> um, but um, there's a lot to do, um, I'm being flip. But, um, there's a, we feel that there's a need, um, uh, this kind of goes hand in hand with the historic rehab survey, or the historic resource survey, sorry. Um, you may also have heard about the, um, the land bank's plans to sell houses to, the, there's like a land bank auction for pretty nice houses at a pretty low cost. Um, and people are buying them, the city has, this is an awesome program, the city has been selling them to people on the condition that they be rehabilitated in about a year um, and that they are owner occupied. So you can't just buy it and uh, be a shadowy landlord who lives in Florida full time. Um, you have to be the person living in it or have a plan to have the building occupied. And um, it's so great. However, a lot of people are buying these properties and they're like, now what do I do? I bought a house for $2,000. It needs so much work. I really don't have that much money. I don't know anybody who knows how to rehab a historic home. I'm stuck. Um, so we've recognized that as a need. And we started this little project. It's called Brick and Beam. And it is kind of a community for people who are rehabbing a home um, and a place to start. Like, where do you go to find a contractor? Where do you go to find some financing? Who do you talk to about roof repair? Um, and uh, we submitted a proposal to the Knight Foundation uh, through a program called the Knight Cities Challenge. We've just found out that we are a finalist in the Knight Cities round and we're doing a prototype of the event to see if people like it and if it's actually gonna work um, this Saturday. And we're really hoping that we get the grant money and that this will be an 18 month long program to start building a culture of support in Detroit for people who are re rehabilitating a building at any level. So whether that's you being lost because you just bought a land bank house or whether that's you being a small scale developer who's looking at rehabilitating a commercial building um, or whether you're a contractor who just is looking for people who need your services and you want to be part of a network that can help you do that. So we're really excited about that. Um, education is a huge part of our educate or that's yes we have a lot of educational efforts the the kind of centerpiece of which is our tours program so I hope that all of you this summer will come visit us at the McKenzie house and join us on a tour um, we do walking tours every Saturday and the intent of the walking tour is to showcase historic architecture in Detroit neighborhoods we do one in Eastern Market we do one in the Cultural Center slash Midtown and we do one in uh, downtown Detroit um, yeah, this is from downtown, this is the front of the Metropolitan Building, which we all hope will be under rehabilitation soon. Um, and it's a great way to just get people oriented with the community. It's a great place uh, to start if you haven't been back to the city in a while and you want to check it out. Um, and it's a great way to learn about architectural styles, architectural history. Um, we just think of it as a great orientation and we think that people who are educated about what's around them will care about it and advocate for it to their friends and family. Um, we also do a num number of special tours throughout the year to showcase 
um, some really great assets in Detroit. This is our, um, the biggest of which is our annual theater tour. So every August, we do a backstage tour of eight different historic theaters in Detroit. Um, Detroit, as many of you probably know, has an incredible collection of historic theaters. It was the, um, I believe the number is more, uh, more seats than Broadway, or like just as many seats as Broadway, um, back in the heyday of uh, Detroit in the theater and movie days. So um, our theater tour is a big deal. Uh, it sells out every year. It is a huge event for us, and it's a really incredible one-of-a-kind theater tour uh, for people who are interested in that. Again, it's every August. We don't have a date set yet, but keep your eye out for that. Oh, we're also doing a very, very small version of our theater tour this Saturday. Um, we're only doing one theater, um, but we're partnering with the Freep Film Festival, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, they have screenings going on all weekend, and in between screenings, we are doing a little happy hour at the State Bar, which is next door to the Fillmore Theater. During the happy hour, we're running tours every hour of the Fillmore Theater. So if you've ever wanted to check that building out and get backstage, you can do that on Saturday. Um, in October, we do cemetery tours. This is my great love. Um, this is the front gate of Elmwood Cemetery. Um, this is how I started getting involved in Preservation Detroit. I was doing my own cemetery tours. They were like, we need a tour guide. I was like, I'm your lady. Um, so <laughs> uh, we do Elmwood, we do Woodmere, we do Woodlawn, and we do Mount Elliott. And uh, those happen every Saturday in October. This year, we might add a few more. Uh, we also do um, tours that are based on specific works of uh, a single architect. Um, last year and the year before, we did a, a Minoru Yamasaki tour around the cultural corridor. We may do this again this year. Um, we also do educational events that aren't just tours, if you don't like walking around. <laughs> um, we, have a, uh, we have a lecture series every month. We do a lecture on the third Friday of the month. This year, actually, our lecture, we moved to the fourth Friday of the month. Um, and this month's lecture is about the Ford Wyoming Drive-In. So we are uh, hosting the author, Karen Dybus, who just wrote a book about the Ford Wyoming. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. We also do a lecture series occasionally. It's not regularly scheduled. We just do it as needed. But um, we have a series called Where We Used to Live. And we invite people who grew up in Detroit's historic neighborhoods to talk about what it was like when they used to live there. Um, we've done two of these so far. We did one last year at the Hastings Street Ballroom with Martha Music. And Martha Music, Marsha Music, I'm sorry, I always call her Martha. Mar Marsha Music uh, did a talk about her father, Jovan Battle, who had a record store on Hastings Street um, in Old Black Bottom, which of course was completely demolished to make way for I-375. And uh, we did another one at St. Cecilia's Parish. That's what this is a picture of, uh, with uh, Stephen Henderson, the Pulitzer Prize winning opinion page editor of the Detroit Free Press, who, uh, whose father lived on Tuxedo Street on the northwest side, uh, right in the St. Cecilia Parish neighborhood. Um, we also had the opportunity to hear from the man who painted this mural that you see. I know it's probably a little low resolution and hard to, hard to see, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a actually a very significant work of um, religious art. It is, a, it is an African American Jesus. And um, it was painted right after the riots. And the idea was that part of the anger that was fueled in the, in the African American community in Detroit was because, um, because there was no reflection of that community in wider public life, right? You had white leadership and white faces on uh, all of your books. And there was just no reflection of that, of that community in wider public life. And the idea was, if we built, um, if we if we depicted a black Jesus, we would be giving a reflection of Jesus' love to the to the African uh, sorry African American community. This is also a Catholic church, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and uh, we got to meet the mural painter, and he was so wonderful and told us a beautiful personal story about his experience painting this mural. This is a, one of I think Detroit's most unsung architectural gems, art art and architectural gems. Um, it's also right across the street from the uh, St. Cecilia's basketball gym, which is a famous basketball gym, uh, where Magic Johnson trained. Um, we also do research projects. We do them uh, not as frequently as we used to, but uh, they're still an important part of our work. In 2013, we partnered with the Wayne State Department of Archaeology, and we did a research project at Tommy's Bar, which is on 1st Street in downtown Detroit. Um, there is a tunnel underneath Tommy's Bar that was used during the Prohibition days to, um, you know, ship goods back and forth. 
goods that come in barrels and smell like whiskey. Um, so uh, we, uh, the archaeology department did an excavation of the tunnel, and um, they found all sorts of really cool stuff. And our job in this collaboration was to throw a big party. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we had artifacts on display. The students from the anthropology department did a presentation. We did tours of the tunnel under Tommy's bar. And we had drink specials. And we all dressed like flappers. And it was great fun. Um, a lot of what we do is awareness raising. This is kind of a close, a close partner to advocacy. Um, I tend to think of adv advocacy as a little more like go to the city meeting, yell at the public official, submit my letter of comment, and um, play by the rules. Awareness raising is a little broader. It's a little more about just helping people understand the importance of the history um, and the architecture that we enjoy in Detroit. Um, uh, one project that I've been working on is the National Theater, which is the building on Monroe Street. It's the only theater um, or I'm sorry, the only building left from the old Monroe block. And it's also um, the oldest uh, surviving theater in Detroit. It was built in 1911. It's Albert Kahn's designed building, his only theater building that we know to exist. Um, and it's just been sitting there open to the elements with the back door broken in and the roof gone for like 20 years. The guy who owns it is demolishing it by neglect. And um, he, we, uh, we, just want, we just want people to feel like this is not just Preservation Detroit's problem, it's everybody's problem to share in as, as members of the public. It's not locally designated, there are no plans for it right now. There's been some talk of the city maybe acquiring it, maybe giving it to Bedrock to uh, redevelop the parcel, um, but nothing is really moving. So all we can do right now is help people understand that the National Theater is a really important piece of Detroit's history and really deserves better than the fate that it currently has. We hope to inspire people to take action. In, in Something that I think about a lot is how we can empower everybody in the community to, to advocate for preservation, to consider themselves preservationists. Um, you know, I, going back to what, why originally how I introduced myself and I said I didn't know anything about buildings and I didn't really think of myself as an architecture person, I'm the kind of person that should be making these calls to city council, writing these letters. Of course, now that's what I do. But before I felt that way about myself, before Preservation Detroit was like, no, this is about you too. I didn't believe it. Um, so uh, we have some work to do to help inspire people like me to believe that they, that they have a voice and that they have a role to play in preserving the history of Detroit. Um, so um, I hope that um, you know people read this op-ed and they say, "Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna call um, I'm gonna call my city councilor and ask what's going on with this building, or I'm gonna take a picture of it and put it on Facebook and ask what people know what's going on here, or um, you know just uh, tell my mom about it and hope she <laughs> hope she goes and drives by it the next time she's in town, um, so that when action is needed, people are ready to take action because they know the, they know about this building, they know why it's important, they know the story behind it, and they care." Um, I'll end, I feel like this has been a sad night. Um, I'll end on a sad story, um, but one that I, that I hope inspires um, hope. I hope it inspires hope. Um, this is the, uh, the ruins of the First Unitarian Church. This is a church on Woodward Avenue. It's right next door to First Presbyterian Church, which is the big building you see in the background. Um, First Unitarian uh, burned down last year in a big fire. Um, that we consider very suspicious. Um, the owner had been neglecting the building for a long time, um, almost 10 years, and um, we had started to get phone calls about six months before the fire from people in the Brush Park community um, asking what was going on with the building, did we know if there were demolition plans. Uh, we had not heard anything about demolition plans, so we called the Historic District Commission and we said, hey, we're hearing rumors about this. They said, as far as we know, they haven't submitted any requests. We don't think that... Um, Anything is going on here. Um, a week later, they did get a request from the building owner who said, I'm, I'm interested in demolishing my property. I'd like to submit a certificate of approval for consideration. And um, what I was told was that the Historic District Commission was really upfront with him. They were like, this is a really important historic building. We are not going to vote to let you demolish it, just so you know. <laughs> You're welcome to go through the process and submit your, your uh, letter of request, but it's very unlikely that we're going to do it. And you seem to have no reason to want to do it, besides that you just don't like this building anymore. And uh, it's just not how it works when you're part of a historic district. Um, so the guy submitted his request again, and then he submitted it again, and then he retracted it. And then things went quiet for about two months. Um, and then we got a phone call on the morning of May 10th that the building was on fire. Um, and um, it within the, by the end of the day, it had been torn down. Um, so uh, we're not sure what happened. 
Um, it's really hard to investigate arson in the city of Detroit for a couple of reasons, um, largely related to city finances. There is only uh, there are a handful of arson investigators in Detroit. Also, most of the, they're just as a huge scale. Arson is a huge problem in Detroit, so those three or four arson investigators are incredibly busy and very overworked. Um, it's also really hard to prove what happened when you have an arson. You can get to the point where you say it was an arson, but you can't really say. I know who did it, or I'm sure it was the owner, or um, whatever. So um, most of these crimes go unprosecuted. This is also a national problem. Everybody who lives in a city has an arson problem, and they don't know how to solve it. Um, so w right now, my dream, when I go to bed at night, I think, how can I solve the arson problem? I'm going to brainstorm some ideas, but um, I'm not there yet. So anyway, um, we were just devastated by this news. I was personally devastated by this news. This is a building that I felt kind of close to. Um, it was uh, built in the 1890s by um, a group of Unitarians. Um, and as a student of the uh, Detroit in the 1800s, I was familiar with many of these people who were leaders in their community. They wanted to build a space where they could um, choose to not be super religious, but still have that fellowship and community. And um, they, um, many of them were civic leaders and philanthropists in the city of Detroit. And there's this great, I wish I had brought it, um, but they, the, the dedication speech from when they opened this church was so moving. It was written by a guy named Thomas Palmer, who's also the namesake of Palmer Park, a huge donor to the uh, foundation of the Detroit Institute of Arts. And Thomas Palmer basically talked about how he was not building this building for the people of today, that he was building this building for the future, and that he was building the building so that people would be inspired when they drove by it to do good deeds in their life. And it was so heartbreaking to read that speech um, after this building was demolished. Um, anyway, w it was we weren't blindsided by this news. We knew the owner was up to no good. We knew that this building was at risk, but we just didn't there weren't enough levers to make things happen fast enough, and once the building owner retracted his petition to the Historic District Commission, we kind of were left with very few options. Um, and, um, and we decided to commemorate this building with a public service the week after it had burned down on a Sunday night. Um, and uh, we brought a band out. You can't really see in this picture, but I think one of the trumpeters is up on the rubble pile. Um, and we invited um, the pastor from today's Unitarian Church, which is w had been unaffiliated with this building for a long time, um, but he came and gave kind of a, non, a non-denominational sermon. We had music, we had a, s a few people give speeches. Um, and the idea was just to illustrate that something had been lost and that um, this building wasn't just an empty building with no windows and homeless people sleeping on the steps. This was a building that was part of our collective memory. It's a building that is part of our personal memory. We all drive by it, it <laughs> to and from Tigers games or whatever. And, um, and it, it's a building that had a story to tell. It wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a silent, hulking object. Um, and now that it's gone, it will never come back. Um, so we wanted to raise awareness to it in that way. Um, and to inspire people to think about how to protect buildings now instead of waiting until they fall down um, to do something about it. And that requires attention to, um, uh, to policy, that requires constant vigilance, lots of advocacy, um, you know, calling your city council representative and being a jerk all day long <laughs> um, until everybody's tired of you. And um, you know, it does, it's not going to happen overnight. Preservation isn't always going to work. But uh, right now, it's the best tool we have for making sure that these buildings are part of our future. Um, and that's why I do what I do. So that's my speech. Um, we have, uh, we, there are lots of ways to reach me. We're all over the internet. Um, you can learn more about us at preservationdetroit.org. You can sign up for our email list. We're on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm also happy to give you my personal contact information if you have um, questions um, or want to get in touch with me later. And um, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it. <laughs>